A malevolent spirit lurks in the shadows of forests and the darkest mountains of the Philippines. Capable of adopting physical form, the most terrifying, a massive, half-human, half-horse hybrid, the Filipino Tikbalong thrives on chaos. Capable of imitating any human and cursing the living with illness, this creature's cruel, high-pitched laugh signals horror to come. In most modern interpretations, the Tikbalong is imagined primarily with equine features, but horses aren't native to the Philippines. So where do the origins of this monster come from? I'm Dr. Emily Zarka, and this is Monstrum. The Tikbalong is at its core a malevolent spirit being. While usually incorporeal, it can take on physical form as an old man, monkey, or horse hybrid creature. While their shape may change, their gender rarely does. Tikbalongs are traditionally male. In their equine guise, their heads and legs mimic a horse, with their arms and torsos appearing human-like. They're very tall and very thin, features made more distinct by their ungainly seat. A tikbalang is like a minotaur, except instead of a bull's head, it has a horse's head, a humanoid body, and a horse's feet. It is a creature that you would encounter at the crossroads uh, in the provinces. So when you're going home at night and you're all alone, you will meet a tikbalang. That's Budget Tan, writer and co-creator of the comic series Tresse, a series based on Filipino folklore and mythology that prominently features Tikbalong characters. I can't remember if it was through stories that I heard from relatives or was it a movie that I saw as a kid where uh, Dolphy, a very popular actor in the Philippines who's known to be the king of comedy, appeared uh, as a tikbalang in a movie called Once Upon a Time, where we saw Dolphy, you know, transform into a tikbalang. And there was even this scene where he like carries the two kids and they jump over the moon. I'm not even sure if I'm remembering right, but these are the images that are stuck in my head as far as seeing a tikbalang on screen is concerned. Existing in caves, trees, and bamboo groves deep in the forest, this monster can imitate anyone and can turn invisible at will, which it uses for one of its favorite pastimes, tricking and killing local travelers. Commonly, the Tikbalong will lure someone off their regular course before keeping them trapped and terrified in the forest for days. Take, for example, the legend of the farmer's son. One day, a farmer's son was hurrying home after running an errand at his uncle's house when a stranger approached him in the forest. Although he tried to ignore the mysterious man, from the corner of his eye he saw that he was very, very tall and very thin. The two began a conversation as the man kept in stride with the boy, his feet making a clomping sound as they walked. The man's long black hair hung to his bare shoulders, only partially covering his extremely hairy neck and his eyes glowed with blue fire, contrasting with the red glow of the cigar in his large mouth. The stranger coyly pulled the boy deeper into the woods and off his path. Lost and frightened, the boy allowed the man to take his hand. When the boy sat down to rest, the stranger picked him up and carried him further into a dense bamboo forest. The mysterious man then laughed a strange, high-pitched chuckle and abandoned the boy alone in the dark. The next morning, his parents were frantic that they could not find their son. After a long search, they found the terrified boy, sick and delirious with fever. Falling ill is a common element of the legend. It's said that to even catch a glimpse of this creature might cause illness, a fever, or a headache, or even blindness. Sudden death is also an even unluckier consequence. If a Tikbalong calls out your name wishing illness upon you, there is little hope for a cure. It was five days before the boy's fever finally broke and he regained consciousness. When he told his family what he had seen, his father concluded the child had survived an encounter with a Tikbalong. His mother wisely warned him to never go into the woods with a stranger again. Like much of the folklore of the Philippines, written accounts of this story appeared after Spanish colonizers began to record the practices and beliefs of the indigenous peoples. Missionary priests wrote of widespread fear of the monster, a kind of ghost that can appear as an animal or monster and compel them to do evil deeds. But it's likely that the oral legend of the Tikbalong was altered when translated and written down by the Spanish colonizers. The Tikbalong legend likely evolved as a blend of Filipino traditions and foreign beliefs. 
Filipino animism practices largely revolve around respect, with veneration paid to ancestors and placation sought from malevolent spirits. A tricky invisible force being is well within the realm of possibility. The Uswang Project presents an addition to this theory, the early Hindu presence in the Philippines. Early religious iconography of Hinduism, found in the Philippines dating to the 9th and 14th centuries, proves the religion had a cultural presence on the islands. One of the avatars of the prominent god Vishnu appears with a horse head on a human male body, ascribing the attributes of speed and strength to the deity, characteristics that would be adopted into existing ideas of the Tikbalong spirit being. Indigenous Filipino inhabitants adapted components like foreign language, social practices, and religion into their own existing cultural beliefs. So while many indigenous peoples seem to willingly adopt religions, like Christianity after the Spanish arrived, many of their older spiritual practices were maintained in secret. In 1613, Father Pedro de San Buenaventura described the Tikbalong as a giant foul-smelling ghost or phantasma with wings that kidnapped men and weakened them until they died. Increasingly, the Tikbalong became seen as evil or demonic, to use Christian terminology. This parallels Spain's movement towards a religious framework that had a defined system of good and evil, a dichotomy made gruesomely obvious with the witchcraft trials of the 16th and 17th centuries. First introduced by Muslim travelers in the southern regions of the Sulu Archipelago and what is now known as the Mindanao Island, it's likely that the horses of this region came from trade between sultanates during the 14th and 15th centuries and helped inspire the Tikbalong's horse form. With the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors in 1565, the horse population in the Philippines grew and became sustainable. Spanish colonialism depended heavily on horses, on the military advantage, travel convenience, and perceived social status equines provided. The island location of the Philippines was a significant traveling distance from the Spanish supply lines of the animals located in Central America, North America, and Europe. So they turned to China and Japan for horses. By the beginning of the 17th century, horse trade and breeding farms were well established in the area. A lack of natural pasturage and food supply meant the horses bred in the islands were smaller than their ancestors. Continuing into the 18th century, when missionaries uncovered indigenous spiritual traditions, they quickly labeled the practicing individuals as wizards who could cause or cure illness and who could change themselves into animals in order to kill others. The more frequent references to horses with Tikbalong lore may have resulted from these changes, with Spanish text descriptions increasingly accentuating the hybridity of the monster's appearance. Today, this interpretation of the Tikbalong lingers, particularly in comics. Arnold Are's award-winning The Mythology Class, first published in 1999, was really the first introduction of the Tikbalong to modern popular culture. Extremely muscular and tattooed, Are's version appears more in line with what readers had come to expect in traditional superhero comics. Their portrayal changed when they started to appear in pop culture. That's when the creators of their times, you know, whether it was the 80s, 90s, or comic book creators today have started to take liberties on how to portray the Tikbalang. It's one of those creatures that has become pretty much open to interpretation as far as what is the best way they serve the story. In the world of Tresse, the creatures are also incredibly strong and muscular. Instead of shape-shifting, they can produce a magical glamour that allows them to appear as regular humans. Now a popular Netflix series, the animated portrayal of the Tikbalong reinforces the muscular horse hybrid appearance to an even wider global audience. These are our stories, and if we don't retell them, they will soon be forgotten. I think we need to keep retelling these stories and find new ways to tell them, tell them in our, in our own ways. It's not because we want this to be the definitive you know, storyline of what the Tikbalang is, but again, it's what sparks the imagination, it's what strikes fear, and hopefully this will inspire the reader or viewer to want to know more. Whether it's the terrifying and gangly version of Tikbalong from tales told in the Philippines centuries ago, or the ripped and tatted incarnation that we see on Netflix today, one thing is certain, the legend is likely to endure for many years to come. Sulu Archipelago, Sulu Archipelago, Sulu Archipelago, Archipelago, Sulu Archipelago, 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 Sulu Archipelago. <laughs>
of the Sulu Archipelago. <laughs> I think we just need to be done.